The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Galatians 4. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is the owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. So he's picking up on the theme of the old covenant people and their status, uh, that they're heirs, they own everything, but God has kept them in this status of uh, a minority. And they weren't much better than slaves. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we, notice moving from the old covenant people to all the covenant people, that we might receive adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, therefore you're no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, an heir through God. This is the glorious truth that we will begin with uh, this evening. Let's pray. <coughs> we bless you, our Holy Father, that you indeed are our Father and our Redeemer, and that we are your sons and daughters. We pray that you'll teach us to revel in this great relationship that you have bestowed upon us, to marvel at your goodness that not only would you pardon our sins and constitute us righteous, but that you would actually bring us into your family and make us co-heirs with your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Will we ask that as we study tonight and we see our adoption, that we'll see as well that we are children uh, through the work of your Spirit indwelling us and you're actually shaping us in your image through the glorious work of our sanctification and that that will manifest itself in good works. So as we study, we pray that your spirit will illumine our understanding and that you will cause us to love these truths, to examine our lives by them and to walk in the light as you, Lord, are in the light. Forgive us of our sins. We cry out in dependence upon you now. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> So one of the adventures that happened on this trip was my tablet messed up. It's got a thing right there in the middle of it that is, it's not the screen that's cracked, it's the digital whatever. 300 bucks to fix it. So I just bought a new one. I'm assuming it is. But this one we have actually happened to have and well, there he is. Dotson. Mr. Dotson, you're late. I, I am. <laughs> but we're glad you're here. Classroom. Oh, thank you. Dr. Papa, the you know, what happened was is it was like 4.33 and I didn't see you, so I went to make a cup of coffee, so I asked that you forgive so me. So I'm late. <laughs> but I've already asked forgiveness for being late and you missed it. And I had a better ex I had a better excuse than a cup of coffee. <laughs> so anyway, I'm glad you're here. Class would never be the same without you, you know that. Uh, that's my concern, Dr. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Okay, so we're at chapter 12 in the Confession. All those that are justified, God vouchsafeth. That's a big fancy word. What does it mean? Guaranteed. Guaranteed. God vouchsafeth in and for his only Son, Jesus Christ, to make partakers of the grace of adoption by which they are taken into the number and enjoy the liberties. <coughs> and privileges of children of God, had his name put upon them, received the spirit of adoption, have access to the throne of grace with boldness, are enabled to cry, Abba, Father, are pitied, protected, provided for, and chastened by him as a father. He had never cast off, but sealed to the day of redemption. 
and inherit the promises as heirs of everlasting salvation. Our catechism, adoption is an act of the free grace of God in and for his only Son, Jesus Christ, whereby all that those that are justified are received into the number of his children, have his name put upon them, the spirit of his Son given to them, are under his fatherly care and dispensations, admitted to all the liberties and privileges of the sons of God, made heirs of all the promises and fellow heirs with Christ. So you can see how, <clears throat> in one sense, the larger catechism has a few things not in the more expansive section of the confession. And then the shorter catechism, adoption of the act of God's free, free grace, whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. A very succinct, then, summary of <clears throat> what we have here. So notice again our couples, couplets, so that um, here we have those that are justified, are adopted, and we see the relationship uh, that uh, exists between the two things. Justification, you recognize, is a judicial concept. And so it's in the courtroom for God pardons our sins and constitutes us legally righteous. In adoption, we move from the courtroom to the living room. We move out of the court. God is judge. We come now to God as Father. And so it accompanies justification, but it is a distinct act. Now, it's interesting that although this is clearly stated in our standards, it's spelled out by Calvin in the Institutes, that not many have appreciated the doctrine of adoption. And some, like Dabney, actually made adoption a subset, one of the benefits of justification. But you see the difference as, as we uh, begin to look at it, that, that adoption really is a second act of God's grace. Notice that concept. Like justification, it's an act of grace. And what does the term act imply? A singular event. Hmm? A, singular event. A, sing a singular event. Go ahead, Mr. Dotson. Uh, I was going to say, when the, the confession uses the word act, it means a singular, immediate event and not an ongoing process. When it speaks of an ongoing <laughs> process, it uses the word work. Okay. And the only reason I know that is because WBGT shed. Well, if you'd listened to your classmate, you'd have known it was right <laughs> off. <laughs> All right. So it is a separate act, though, and not an act that is simply um, not something that flows out of the act of <clears throat> justification. Now, you can't be adopted if you're not justified. Why would that be? Because you can't be treated with God's good benefits. I have a question, Dr. Piper. Can you say that adoption is a legal act or no? I would. Okay, thank you. Because it's, uh, it's something that God is doing. Um, and the, parallel, the language he uses would be a legal act. So in, in both... Uh, Hebrew culture and Greek culture, Roman culture, there would have been these legal acts of adoption. And since an inheritance is involved, but yes, I would say in that sense, it is a legal act. So it's an act, <clears throat> be here, of free grace in 1 John 3, 1. Uh, John marvels at this glorious fact that we are the sons of God. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God and such we are. And then in this, the justified person is brought into, numbered among um, the children of God with all the liberties and privileges of such. The idea of liberty, John 1, 12, as many as believed on him, to them he gave the right, the authority, to become the sons of God. 
Romans 8, 17, again, this uh, work that God does, uh, act, receives the name of God, Revelation 3, 12, this great name. Uh, we see this in Larger Catechism 74. Um, <clears throat> receiving the number of his children, have his name put upon them. And so we are named with the name of God, and that, of course, takes place uh, in your baptism as you're baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and receive the spirit of adoption. Now, in the two Pauline passages that deal with adoption, we see the role of the spirit in both of these. In Romans chapter 8, for all who are being led, verse 14, by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So if you're one of those who's filled with the spirit, you're a child of God. By the way, ladies, Paul uses the word son because it is a legal act. And in both cultures, normally the heir was uh, the male heir. And so he, you could almost say that son is a synonym for heir. And that's what Paul is doing here. He's, he's emphasizing the inheritance that belongs to all who are adopted as children of God. You've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. You've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with <clears throat> our spirit that we are children of God. And then in Galatians 4, it's very interesting, you get the two... Um, Directions, so to speak. Uh, in, in Galatians 4, because your son, God has sent forth his spirit, the spirit of his son, into your heart, crying out. So the spirit enables us to cry out, and the spirit is crying out himself. And this is what it means when we say the spirit is the seal or the earnest of our redemption. So he's working in us to testify to us that we are the children of God, and himself is calling out to God on our behalf and calling out to us as well. Then we have the benefits of adoption. So what's the first one that we have? Access to the throne of grace. Mm -hmm. Access to the throne of grace. Okay. Access to the throne of grace. Bold access to God in prayer. It's a marvelous thing to consider. That, um, let me do one more thing before we go to that. And that is notice the relationship of Christ to this, both in the confession, in and for his only son, Jesus Christ, and in and for his only son, Jesus Christ, in the larger catechism. Uh, and that goes back to Galatians 4, that Christ redeemed us uh, from the law that we might become the children of God. And so it's actually an act of Christ, part of the result of the atonement that by his redeeming work, he purchased for us the, the lost inheritance. And so this goes back to the old covenant idea of the kinsman redeemer and restoring the lost uh, inheritance by a price, the redemption price was paid, it was Christ's blood uh, by which we are redeemed. Thus we have bold access to God in prayer. It's, a, it's an amazing thing, isn't it, to consider that uh, as children of God that we have free access into His presence um, 24 hours a day, every day of the week. And when you are tempted, as all of us are, get up in the morning, we've got our time for prayer, and suddenly we think of three things that really is, are important that we need to do, and, and we draw back. Remind yourself 
that it cost the Savior his own life and the satisfaction of God's justice, the redemption, so you could pray. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> because of that, were Old Testament believers adopted in the same way that we are now, uh, with us having that access that they, uh, you know, that they had to go through the priestly system in order to have? Well, yes and yes, they did. Paul says in Romans 9 they had the adoption. Um, the priestly system uh, was basically tied into the temple worship and the sacrifices, but we find plenty of prayers, don't we? I mean, look at the Psalms. Uh, other people praying. Uh, Hannah's prayer. Um, so they didn't have the... F when we get to the chapter on Christian liberty, we'll see that they didn't have the full liberty that we have, but they did have that access of adoption. It's just adoption is underplayed in the Old Testament because it needed to be tied to the redeeming work of Christ, and they were in their minority. But there are Paul's statement in Romans 9 and other statements where they, God is referred to as their father. Uh, Malachi 4, it's rebuke, but you call me father. Uh, where's my honor? Uh, he tells Pharaoh, you know, let me dismiss my son, bring my son out of, out of captivity. So it was there, but it wasn't with the same uh, glorious emphasis. But yes, they, they had access in prayer on the basis of what Christ would do. <clears throat> What's the second benefit? Pity. Pity. Yes, sir. Can you explain a little bit this word boldness? Like, boldness would be confidence? Confidence uh, is a good way to, to put it, Fabio. Um, that we're going to be heard. It's also boldness that we may boldly state our case. Have you ever considered that the petitions in the Lord's Prayer are all the imperative? Mm -hmm. We call it the imperative of prayer. Okay. We pray for things that we know are consistent with God's will, then we can say, give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into uh, temptation. And God would actually have us to uh, argue, as we see uh, Abraham or Moses or Nehemiah, Lay out a case before God, pleading his names, his attributes, his promises, his covenant. And God wants us to learn to pray like that, to plead. So yeah, it it's, needs to be a lively and uh, energetic, um, full stating of case. Also a... Uh, ad hoc, just out of the occasion, or just going through the day and, 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 and conversing with God uh, about life, about things, or praising Him, or whatever. That free access and bold access. Hannah? Could you uh, talk a little bit about the balance between going to God as our Father and revealing Him as our Savior? Because it seems like that's a balance. Well, I think that uh, for if those of you that have had a godly father probably can understand this better than I could. Uh, but a godly father evokes both reverence and love. So a godly father, you love him and you know he loves you. But a godly father is also revered for his dignity, his stature. Uh, you don't want to offend him. You want to please him. And you want to treat him with proper reverence. structure of our prayer, God has laid out Jesus that the structure of the way that our prayer should be. And previously my prayers have been a lot more like what you're describing more uh, throughout the day or, or even when I sat down with my prayer it was more just like we would not necessarily structure like that. And I, well, I think it should be both. You see, I think right. the second should grow out of the former. Again, you know, I'll talk to people. Yeah, I, I go for my two mile walk and pray. But Christ says when you pray, Go aside into your closet and pray both in secret, formally, with structure. And he gives the, gives the Lord's Prayer. So that needs to be the basis of our prayer life. It's out of that, then, that we go through the day uh, praying and communing with God. But 
So it's not an either or, it is both and, and the foundation is very necessary. Right, so when I mean the balance, that's kind of what I mean, is between those two things, it's not either or, which I can recognize, but for example, if I'm going through the day, and I'm going to make a quick prayer, it's not going to be the whole... Well, no, but you've done that. Structure. So what you're saying is like the structure should take more place when you have your actual... That's why I said you should draw, draw aside in private for structured prayer. Out of that then comes the um, various praying through the day or praying through a particular situation or whatever. So we don't always uh, then continue to uh, go through all of those various parts of prayer. You're, gonna, you're not praying for the kingdom necessarily. You're tempted, you're praying about your temptation or you're frightened, you pray about your fear or uh, you're about to have a conversation and you pray about the conversation. That's because you've been in a more formal type communion where you have prayed more comprehensively. So it's not like if I'm praying throughout the day. One thing that was confusing for me when you were saying uh, about the structure of the prayer was that uh, I, had, I was under the impression that everything that I pray has to fit into one of the categories. And then it makes me like a little bit stressed when I'm praying, like, which category does this fit into if I'm not praying? Before? Well, I would, I'd rather approach it this way. The categories cover everything you pray about. You see the difference? And you don't worry about what category this is in during the day. Um, but that's where the larger catechism exposition of the Lord's Prayer, we won't get to do a lot with, but uh, it's so useful because if you really structure your prayer according to that, that really encompasses everything. Uh, any petition, any lawful petition you would have is going to be covered by one of those petitions in the Lord's Prayer. But you don't have to stop and think about that during the day. You know if it's, uh, if it's a proper thing to pray for, then pray for it. And what would be an improper thing to pray for? Things that are sinful or contrary to God's revealed will. So I know of a young man who was sitting in the swing, <coughs> swinging with a young lady, and the young man prayed, Lord, if you want me to kiss her, cause her to turn and look at me. Um, that is an improper prayer. Kissing her should be governed by Scripture, not by her turning and looking at it. So, uh, are praying for things to satisfy other lusts. So, the children of Israel in the wilderness prayed for quail. But they did so improperly. So, what does God? He gives them the quail, and then punishes them in their lust by their overeating quail. So, we pray for those things that are lawful, uh, but not unlawful or sinful or satisfying our lust. But anything that's a lawful matter of loving God or loving our neighbor or loving ourself, uh, then is, is a proper matter to pray for. You don't have to stop and try to peg it into uh, a slot. Or in these prayers through the day, it's not a matter of having to begin each one formally uh, addressing, praising uh, God and, and moving in that way. No, it's, you're praying out about a need. Or you're just praying out of communion. You're praying out of thanksgiving or something comes to mind or a person comes to mind and you, um, you pray. Does that help? Good. Pitied as children. Uh, Psalm 103 uh, the Lord knows that we are but dust. Verse 13, and he pities us. What a father. So again, he's so patient. And Exodus 34 speaks of God's goodness. And one of the things is he's slow to anger. What's the next benefit? Protection. Protection. So Psalm 27, 1 through 3, or Proverbs 14, 26. He is our protector. Uh, you know, Israel's got that uh, 
shield and 99% of bad missiles can't get through it. Well, we got a shield and 100% bad missiles can't get through it. That doesn't mean that uh, evil won't happen to us, but if it happens to us, it is by the Father's permission uh, because we can rest 100% in his protection. Now, does that mean we tempt God? Because he's going to protect us, we put ourselves deliberately in harm's way, thoughtlessly, uh, walking down a, a street that is known to be uh, dangerous and think, well, God protects me. You know, there might be a calling that takes you there, but just the shortcut, God protects me? No. Yeah. Or walking down a street where you know you're going to be faced with a, a really serious temptation. And you say, well, God will take care of me. Well, you have already should have prayed in the morning, lead me not into temptation, which means you don't put yourself in the way of temptation then, uh, if, unless you're providentially by God placed into that circumstance. But he protects. The next one. He provides a gracious father, Matthew 6, 30 through 32, as he closed the uh, flowers and feeds the birds of how much more value are you, his elect children, than birds and flowers. You need not worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. Um, trust your Father. Uh, our Philippians 4, uh, do not worry that all things with prayer and supplication be made known to God. And the next one's interesting, isn't it? Chastening. Chastening. Uh, those who hold to uh, what we call sonship theology think God has never gets displeased with his children. Now what loving parent would never be displeased with children when they misbehave? Is that love? No. William Perkins uh, gives the illustration uh, that uh, two boys are out in the street fighting and a man comes out and grabs one of them by the nap of the neck and carries him off. What is it you know about the relationship of that man and that boy? It's his son. He didn't get the other one by the neck. He got his son by the neck. And in Hebrews 12 then, it's because he loves us that he chastens us. And again, never unnecessarily, never uh, over severely, always out of love. And I use the idea of, of a restrained hand. It never comes down upon us with the full force of even of a righteous anger because he's a father and it's out of fatherly love. And so even the hand is restrained. Next benefit. All right. Never cast off, but sealed for the day of redemption. Um, so what we see here is that we cannot be disinherited. Uh, but in fact, we have the Holy Spirit as the seal of a permanent relationship. In Roman law, well, uh, Roman aristocrats who had ne'er-do-well sons uh, would uh, often adopt a noble slave as their heir. Probably one of the ideas that Paul had in mind as he talks here about adoption, name, liberty, and privileges. Uh, and in Roman law, he could never disinherit that. He could disinherit his natural son. He did to adopt the other one. But you could never disinherit an adopted son. And that is what we're being promised here. It's another way to talk about uh, eternal security. Now, because we are adopted, God is not going to cast us off. And the Spirit who indwells us is the pledge and the guarantee and the surety. So it's just as uh, the Groffs bought this house. Ryan, I guess y'all bought a house too? Yeah, just down the way. Good. So in buying the house, they got to give a, a down payment. And that down payment is supposedly the pledge that they'll continue to make payments for the house and a rightly ordered society. It is. Well, the Holy Spirit is our down payment. 
and God will not take him from us. And then uh, the next benefit Heirs of the promises. But all the promises in Christ are what? Yes and amen. Yes and amen. And they all belong to us because of union with Christ Jesus. So again, when you read the Psalms, and you read the Psalms through the, the lens that uh, Christ is the righteous one. Every single Psalm. Uh, and that which is His is yours because you are in Him and thus you also are co-heirs. Uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ of everlasting salvation and to rule and reign with him. 1 Peter 1.4 and Hebrews 1.14. We see the promises of Hebrews 6.12 and those texts are all here in your footnotes in your, in your textbook. Now, not in the confession, but just for your own benefit, ways to test adoption. Um... Are you believing in Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God? 1 John 5, 1. You love the brethren. Abram. So I have to uh, derail you, but I'm... That's okay. There's a passage. Uh, Mark has really behaved tonight, and so has Mr. Dotson, so you may derail me. And Hannah? She's been pretty restrained. Uh, there's a passage where Jesus says, um, He who works the will of the Father are my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So would you say in regards to that passage that the working of the will of God is also a benefit or a way by which we identify ourselves as, as his children? Why would it have to be either or? Yeah, I think that uh, it is the manifestation of the, that we are sons. Uh, and it's a benefit to be considered the brother of Christ or the sister of Christ. But we, that's why I put good works in here tonight, even though it comes a couple of chapters later, is that that's how our adoption and sanctification manifest themselves, is in good work. Any other questions about the material in the confession? Mark, welcome. Yes, sir. Uh, so we are talking about adoption as God's children, and also uh, in some places in the Bible, we are told that uh, we are bond servants of Christ. So how do we harmonize these two truths in our um, piety, in our prayer life? Well, um, adoption is approaching the Godhead in one way. Uh -huh. uh, bond servant then is a way to express the willing obedience that we give to the Father. Uh -huh. So remember the bond servant was the servant that when he could have been set free, mm -hmm. uh, says, because I love my master, I love my wife, gives himself mm -hmm. then to become the bond servant and uh, has his ear pierced mm -hmm. uh, into the wall. I'm not sure most people would like that kind of piercing <laughs> today, but anyway. Um, and so there's just lots of different figures that should describe our relationship to God because he mm -hmm. is so complex. The relationship is complex. Mm -hmm. But it gets back to the reverence that we only want to please him. Mm -hmm. And so, we, and the bond servant has been purchased for the price, and that Paul says that, therefore glorify God in your body. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, we are not slaves, but in some sense, we are still bond servants. Right. A, the term slave would imply more of a distant relationship. A bond servant is a loving, mm -hmm. voluntary, voluntary relationship. Okay. We're servants, but uh, slaves, no, he would never treat us as a slave. But in New Testament Bible, I think uh, uh, there are who knows saying that the, the bond servants uh, are also translated to slaves. Sometimes. Well, I think sometimes it can be, but we just have to look at the context of those particular passages. So. Come in, sir. I missed the joke back there, even. Fabio was kept coming in late. We were like, oh, is it Fabio again? <laughs>
Well, Fabio comes late. Yeah. Is he on Brazilian, on Brazilian time? Yeah. yeah well. <laughs> Brazilian and African time, man. So, ways to test adoption. You believe on Christ, 1 John 5, 1. You love the brethren, 1 John 3, 14 and 4, 7. Keep the commandments and doing so overcome the world, 1 John 5, 3 and 4. And do not deliberately practice sin. So believe in Christ, 1 John 5, 1. Love the brethren, 1 John 3, 14 and 4, 7. Keep the commandments and so doing overcome the world, 1 John 5, 3, and 4. And do not deliberately practice sin, 1 John 3, 9. But practice righteousness, 1 John 2, 29. The last two is you don't deliberately practice sin, 1 John 3, 9. But you rather practice righteousness, 1 John 2, 29. Just think about it. Uh, uh, trust in Christ, love God, love your neighbor. Uh, don't practice sin, but practice righteousness. But that's really there for a pastoral note. It's not in the confession. We do will come to it. We come to assurance uh, because these are the the marks that we'll go back and look at when we talk about assurance. Doctor Piper, is there a reason why you left off uh, chastening? I mean. I, I realize that you're not always aware you're being chastened, but is chastening a mark of adoption? Can we can we say that? Did you go for coffee again? <laughs> I did. No, sir. I, I expanded didn't. Did on, you say that? I expanded yeah. on a good bit. I even gave an illustration. Oh, Thank that's you. right. You were talking about that. Forgive me. I'm, I I have exams this week, and I'm I'm nervous. So forgive me. <laughs> you're forgiven. Just get some more coffee. <laughs> I, I will do, sir. <laughs> That's fine, Zach. Dr. Piper, can you repeat the last two verses? First John 3, 9, 1 John 2, 9. Yes, 3, 9, don't practice sin. 2, no, 2, 29, practice righteousness. 3, 9, do not practice sin. 2, 29, practice righteousness. Can you briefly tell us what's the reasoning of the some shift theology? Uh, because I think it's so clear in the Bible that God will chasten us when we are sinning. So how could these guys claiming that God would not chasten them? You have to ask them how they can do it. I just know they do. <laughs> it's an aberrant theology. It takes a principle that's good, okay. uh, but uh, I think abuses... They don't. They talk about sonship. They don't have a doctrine of adoption. It's a doctrine of justification. And because you're justified, you are as righteous as Christ is, which in itself is a bit of an overstatement. Uh, you have a righteousness from Christ, but Christ has a righteousness that far exceeds our righteousness because He perfectly did the Father's will on our behalf. Uh, so then, uh, it's, all sin may be boiled down to self-righteousness and pride. And you have to constantly keep dealing with self-righteousness and, uh, and pride. But you don't strive for God in this because that would be legalism. Now I'm parodying this, but that's, I mean, basically that's true. I've got a chapter in our book on sanctification where I actually critique some shifts. So. And we'll come to it more in a few years. In terms of what? Addiction. So addiction. Christians. Addiction. The struggle with addiction. Because you said that the last two is to keep the commandments and so do we overcome the world and don't want to practice sin or out of righteousness. We'll deal with that under sanctification, yes. Thank you. Okay. Sanctification. Notice again the couplings. They who are once effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them, are further sanctified, really and personally, through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection, by His Word and Spirit dwelling in them. The dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and the several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified. 
and they more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces to the practice of true holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Archie Catechism 72, sanctification is a work of God's grace whereby they whom God hath before the foundation of the world chosen to be holy. So what do we have? We've got effectual calling in paragraph one. Now we've taken back to election. Uh, chosen to be holy are in time through the powerful operation of his spirit applying the death and resurrection of Christ unto them renewed in their whole man after the image of God having the seeds of repentance unto life and all of the saving graces put into their hearts and those graces are so stirred up, increased and strengthened as they more and more die unto sin and rise unto newness of life. And then the Shorter Catechism, sanctification is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. So, as I've said, we've, we see it linked now both to um, effectual calling and regeneration with the new heart and beyond that to election. This is a very important issue because you've got, in Lutheran theology, sanctification is related to justification and not to union with Christ and regeneration. And that's the, basically the theme of uh, Mike Horton and the people that follow him out in California. So their sanctification grows out of justification, thus it does not have the same import in their theology that it would have in the Bible or in the standard. Did you ever have it? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so it's very important to see where we begin. Calvin, in Latin, they call it the duplex gratia, the double grace, both things coming from union with Christ, justification and sanctification. But they both come from union with Christ, and that's very important because it's asserted here to keep in mind. Okay? Can you explain the differences between how that plays out as far as distinguishing between it coming from justification versus coming from It comes from, from sanctification. Um, if it comes from regeneration, it's coming with the power. There's a seed of righteousness within us. So it is that concluding statement of the larger catechism without which no man shall see the Lord uh, is, uh, is very, uh, or, or the confession is very true. Whereas uh, when it comes out of justification, there's not a guaranteed power and it plays a much lesser role in Christian experience. I was saying, uh, uh, probably on faith and practice today, that or maybe in the last class, the problem now is, is that people have made justification the end. It's not, it's the beginning. It's not the, the end of our salvation. The end of our salvation is union with, uh, uh, conformity to the image of Christ. The sanctification in terms of Christian living is much more important. Justification is foundational for our acceptance with God. But sanctification is the purpose of God in our conversion. So if uh, justification is the beginning and all of the stuff that follows leads up to final justification? No, we are justified. You can be no more justified uh, 10 years from now or in heaven than you are right now. I'm talking like I've read an article where Dr. P uh, Piper, John Piper, talked about the justification of God. It's in different. In judgment, God will be justified in terms of it will, everything will be made evident of his work in our lives, what he's done. There's a formal acquittal that takes place. Mysteries are explained, but that's. God's justification is a demonstration of God's glory and character. It's not the forensic justification that we have. Dr. Piper? Yes, sir? Uh, is, like, at Westminster West, obviously, there's there's some, I, I don't know, maybe uh, Lutheranism going on. I'm just curious, would those men have been influenced by uh, Hermann Frederick Kohlbrugge or, uh, like, Edward Bowl? I, I wouldn't think so. The RCUS people have been influenced by uh, Kohlbergianism. You know, I, I guess that German... sounds like a Kohlbergian thing, though. In, in, well, it is, but I, I just I don't think that. I think they've been more influenced by, by Luther and Lutheranism more directly than by 
by the other. That's okay. My, my wife's pastor growing up was a Colbergian, so I'm pretty familiar with it. Okay. This was a Dutch reform, I mean a German reformed uh, man that uh, was a bit antinomian uh, in his approach to Christian living. And that's uh, probably not as bad as the press he gets. I like Kohlberger. Just for the record, I think he's great. I must have missed something in terms of the distinction you made between justification and sanctification as it's viewed in the confession compared to how uh, uh, Horton and West Calum all them view it. Uh, so you were saying they view uh, sanctification as something coming out of justification and the yeah. confession say something else? What does the confession say? 77, it talks a little bit about the once and for all justification, but that sanctification is not uh, equal. Well, no, 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 no. You're jumping ahead. Oh. Um, <laughs> so, justification uh, is the source of sanctification in that theology. So it has a, uh, a less important role in Christian experience and Christian living. Mm -hmm. Justification and sanctification both come out of regeneration, effectual calling, faith in Christ. And in sanctification, as we'll see, there's a seed of righteousness planted within us, which makes it absolutely necessary for eternal life. Mm -hmm. Whereas here... Uh, you're not as lucky to say it's absolutely necessary for eternal life because there's no built-in guarantee. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Is this aberrant view connected to the view of two-kingdom theology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because in two-kingdom theology and in uh, republication, you've got a, a weakened view of the, of the law of God. That's not going as far as like free grace theology like that came out of Dallas in the 80s and 90s. No, right. not a, that you could have Christ as Savior, not as Lord. Though I have heard, and it's been more than one voice uh, testimony, on the White Horse Inn there's been occasions, uh, one story of, of a girl who calls in and she's been uh, living with her boyfriend and they're you know, telling her she should stop but she shouldn't question her salvation. Well, pastorally, I would say you should stop. You need to examine your heart. Are you really in Christ? You, you might be. But I'm not going to assure you you're not at this point simply because you have a confession that you've been justified. That's the difference. So you've really got this approach and sonship and hyper-historical redemptive all with a... Uh, Hyper grace, uh, at, I think, at the expense of uh, a proper view of sanctification. Dr. Weiber, I'm just trying to understand how the Lutheran view with sanctification going out of justification <laughs> leads to a weaker view of sanctification. Because there's no power. No. Justification is a legal act. Mm -hmm. so, I'm just, so all it is, 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 it's my role, it's thankfulness, uh -oh. you see. But there's no power. Whereas if it comes from, an, as it says here, notice the language. Um, in larger catechism, having the seed of repentance unto life and all other saving graces put into their hearts. And then in the confession, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them. That's the difference. There's power. When you say seed of righteousness, it makes me think of the infused righteousness that the Roman Catholics would speak of. Can you differentiate? Well, the problem is they're talking about justification. We're talking now about sanctification. So, yeah, there is an infusion of grace in us. But you're in union with Christ and we're justified, but God has also begun this work within us. So there's a, there's, there's, there's a legal righteousness and justification, but there's an inherent righteousness uh, that is part of our sanctification. Yes, sir? I, I don't want to derail you, 
just so you know, but I, you mentioned like what's going on at West Cal and certain Lutheran tendencies. And I'm wondering if you could elucidate to us perhaps the problems, aside from the fact they have an errant theology, confessionally speaking, practically, is this going to breed an antinomianism in the church? Is, what is the practical things that we can be expecting when we're dealing with, I hate to say it, but people influenced by West Cal? Well, let's, let's take West Cal out of it and just say that if you've got uh, an aberrant view of sanctification, contrary to what the confession states, yes, you're going to have problems eventually with antinomianism. It's invariable. Um, it's hard for somebody to hold that position and say, pursue that sanctification without which no man shall see the Lord. That's exactly the language, isn't it, uh, in the confession? without which no man shall see the Lord. Uh, sanctification is absolutely necessary if you're going to go to heaven. And people don't realize that. Perseverance, endurance. We enter into heaven through endurance. I had another question today in faith and practice, a good question, that uh, why, if the promised land was a type of eternal life, did the great majority of the old covenant church perish in the wilderness? Well, Paul answers that question for us in 1 Corinthians 10. They were examples to us of the necessity of perseverance. They did not persevere. And so Hebrews says they didn't couple faith with hearing. But when Hebrews says that in chapter 4, verse 1, it then says in verse 11, Be diligent, therefore, that you enter into that rest. Well, the whole thing is a play on the whole wilderness experience. And so we must persevere. And when we come to that chapter on perseverance, that's why it's entitled Perseverance, not Preservation, our eternal security. And we must grow in holiness. And uh, if we are not growing in holiness, uh, then there's very sound indication that we're inconverted. We can backslide temporarily, but if there's not some growth in us of holiness, then we don't yet have the seed of righteousness. You can tell me all day long I've been justified, and I'm going to say, well, listen, if you're justified, you're being sanctified. The two are Siamese twins. Uh, they are inseparable. Uh, the, <clears throat> the confession here, section one, it ends with literally the, Hebrews 12, 14. Uh, yeah, Hebrews 12, 14. They just lifted it right. Yeah, as I've said to you all in the past, I don't know, I've never have counted the percentage, but a large majority of <clears throat> the sentences in the confession are scriptural sentences. Makes it it makes it very puzzling, Westminster Cow's position. Well, let's quit talking about it. <laughs> just, remember, this goes online. It's, I don't want to be in the business of, of uh, unduly. Uh, let's, that's why let's talk of, of the position that says justification produces sanctification. All right. So sanctification is the growth of the new nature put into us. It is the purpose of election. And it's a glorious thing again to consider. Person, if a person is elect, that the election is unto holiness. Again, in the larger catechism, before the foundation of the world, chosen to be holy, are in time through the powerful operation of the Spirit, plan of death, resurrection of Christ, and then renewed in the whole person. I think it's 2 Thessalonians that uh, puts these two things together. Two thirteen. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith and truth. So there's another example that uh, election is unto sanctification, but sanctification is unto eternal life. And again, there's been an overreaction to the federal vision type of theology that's so objective grace uh, and that uh, people from our side have downplayed the role of sanctification thinking that's works, but no. 
you got to understand there's two uh, dynamic at work. There's an act of grace and justification adoption. It's always going to be accompanied by a work of grace. And we need to keep that in mind in our own experience and then as counselors and pastors and parents as we deal with others. So the grounds of sanctification, union with Christ. So then when we get back to the duplex gladia, uh, the, uh, the double flow of grace from union with Christ in justifying faith and in regeneration, particularly the death and resurrection of Christ applied to us by the Holy Spirit. So in Romans 6, Paul reminds us that because of union with Christ objectively as the covenant head, we died and were buried with him and have been raised with him. And that is the parallel then to the work of the Spirit in our lives applying to us the efficacy of the death and resurrection of Christ. In one place, Paul will say the very power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in you. So regenerating power is the same power as resurrecting power. And that is a very important truth to keep in mind. And then the seed of repentance and righteousness is planted in us uh, in this, uh, in the work of regeneration. Now one more thing here, well, a couple more things in paragraph one, but the first is, I want to, I'll put the question out for you guys. Uh, in sanctification, uh, our role and God's role, is it 50-50, 100-100? What's the relationship of uh, our role in sanctification and God's role in sanctification, or the agent of sanctification. Hmm? Louder. A hundred and a hundred. All right. How many want to say a hundred and a hundred? Raise your hand and sin with Mark. <laughs> <laughs> you got two brothers here. Okay. Fifty-fifty. Well, it's helpful. I'll say 100 guy and zero man. All right, 100 and zero. Raise your hand. <laughs> All right, numbers aren't helpful. How are you, what are you going to do? God works in us, and then we work according to what he works in us. So he's preparing good works for us to do, and then we do them willingly. But what sanctifies us? Your works? You're doing them? No, the, the works are a result of the grace, or the work of Okay, and you just made it 100 and 0. Are you talking about a causative relationship? Sanctification, I didn't say now, means, I said, who sanctifies us? Oh, God. Who's sanctified? Look, look at the language. God is the agent of Okay. By virtue of Christ's death and resurrection, by his word and the spirit dwelling in them. So the spirit dwelling in us. But then the larger catechism, the powerful operation of his spirit applying the death and resurrection of Christ unto them after their whole man. The Holy Spirit is the sole agent of sanctification. He's the perfecter. The third person, remember about our economic trinity, the third person of the trinity, Completes the Trinity, completes God's work. He is the one that uh, completes, applies that work of Christ through regeneration and then sanctification. Uh, but we are to use the means. But our use of the means does not sanctify us. Now you will not be sanctified if you don't use the means, but the means don't sanctify. Let's take an analogy with children. Uh, your children more than likely, are not going to be converted if you do not use the means that God's appointed. But using the means that God has appointed, is that what converts your children? No. It's the Spirit of Christ. And so that's how I want you to think about sanctification, is that it's the Spirit at work in you, which is glorious now. We realize this is the Spirit of the triune God who indwells us and is shaping us from the inside out. When I preach on this, I sometimes use the analogy of a, a little child wanting to uh, look like his or her mother or father. And uh, so they get in front of the mirror and they're going to practice looking like mom or the little boy might put a, you know, get his mom's eye marker and paint a mustache on his face or whatever, you know. And does that make them look like their parent? 
And then one day, adolescence sets in, and they walk into the bathroom and look in the mirror. Ah! There's mom and dad looking back at me, but I didn't get any of the things I wanted. Got big ears, a funny nose, whatever you see. Why? Because physically their nature is in me. Now we even see that with babies, don't we? It looks just like its mama. Or just like his daddy or whatever. Uh, just like his dog. <laughs> no, the nature is, physical nature is in us, and that's why we become conformed to their image. God's spiritual nature is in us. And sanctification is from the inside out. It is the renovation of the internal man uh, conforming us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. So once again, the necessity of it. It's God's work. It's the seed of righteousness. It is going uh, to manifest itself. You understand that? But the other thing is, when we get weary and we see all of our failures, we know the Spirit is the one who's at work in us. And He's the one who will sanctify us. By applying to us the death and resurrection of Christ. And then the work itself, in paragraph 1, and John Murray will make the distinction between definitive sanctification and progressive sanctification. And the confession does as well. And so we read here that the dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed. So we're no longer under the dominion of sin. So Paul says it's no longer your master. Uh, it has been slain. And this, I think, explains the language in 1 John that the one who is in Christ does not sin doesn't mean that we're sinless, but we're no longer under the dominion of sin. That takes place at the moment of regeneration. That seed of righteousness is in us, and this is the, uh, freeing us from the dominion and bondage of the corruption of sin and of Satan. Now, That will be accompanied by progressive sanctification, not the insurance company, but sanctification. <laughs> Lust are weakened and mortified. That means put to death. A greater ability to perform acts of holiness enables one then to come before God. So there is within us then this um, daily pursuit of godliness that grows out of the dominion of sin being broken. So we're seeking to put to death the remnant of sin. If we can jump ahead, uh, paragraph 2 and 3, this sanctification is throughout the whole man, yet imperfect in this life, there abiding still some remnants of corruption in every part, which ariseth a continual and irreconcilable war, the flesh lusting against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. In which war, although the remaining corruption for a time may much prevail, yet through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate part doth overcome. And so the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And you notice here all the scriptural uh, clauses that are simply uh, spaced out here. So, Dominion is broken. We then have the responsibility to put sin to death because God in his wisdom has left within us a remnant of sin. It's, we wish he hadn't, but scripture is quite clear he has. Paul wrestled with it. The things I ought not to do, I do the things that I want to do, I don't do. Or as he says in Galatians 5, the spirit lusts against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit. There is this knocking of head that's taking place. The remnant of sin is the leftover sin nature. Now, it's not another nature. Some of you have heard the evangelical thing that you've got within you, a black dog and a white dog. They've got to change that language today. It's very politically incorrect. But anyway, a black dog and a white dog, and whichever one you feed the most in the morning prevails. No, that's bad anthropology. You don't have two natures. Only Christ has two natures. You have one nature. The unregenerate person has a corrupt nature. The regenerate person has a renewed nature. You're a new person, a new man in Christ Jesus. 
but there's this remnant in you that God and his wisdom has left there for the struggles that he's designed that you go through in the pursuit of holiness. A couple of images. Um, the best one, I think, is the smoldering embers in a fire. I flew into uh, New York City, I think it was two weeks after uh, the 9-11, uh, and I was supposed to go that week. Uh, obviously, you didn't go to New York City the week of 9-11. But two weeks later, and I look over there where the World Tower had been, and you know what I saw? Smoke. And that's what happens in a fire. That's why any kind of major fire, when the fire is out, the fire company always leaves at least one fireman. You know why? <coughs> Because under all of that rubble, there could be embers. And those embers can break out. So that's the way to think about it. Yes, the fire has been put out. The dominion has been broken. But in us are these embers against which we must guard and be watchful and then seek to douse them and put them to death. Now that's God's plan for us. And it's in that, and you, again, take another analogy of exercise. The, the exercise does one good in terms of building muscles only when you tear down muscles. And so uh, it's as we're fighting against sin that we're going to grow more holiness. But if we don't fight against sin, if we don't mortify, John Owen said, kill the flesh or the flesh will kill you. So if we're not engaged in this daily seeking to put sin to death, and we do that uh, by reckoning who we are in Christ and asking Christ to kill our lust. We do that by starving our lust and not feeding them, by knowing our weaknesses and avoiding the occasions that um, um, uh, will uh, feed them, and by using then the means, uh, our baptism and, and the Lord's Supper, to kill this remnant of sin. We must be actively doing that. And then looking at Christ seeking to be like him using the means of grace and we've got the pattern then of his law any of you old enough to remember ryan is um, uh, the, the, the wwjd what would jesus do i wanted to make a t-shirt i was going to put on the front wwjd and on the back of the ten commandments that's what jesus did when it looked like jesus walked by his law uh, and so we pursue that now this gets to Hannah's question with respect to addictions. Is that where you wanted to go with your hand? Okay. Um, there are life-dominating sins. We call them addictions. And the Bible can physically become, I mean, the body can become physically addicted to things or psychologically addicted through the repeated abuse. We're not addicts by nature. We're corrupt sinners by nature. But it's not a physiological problem, I'm trying to say. It's not like blood pressure. That's the 12-step the, uh, program. No. It, it's, God doesn't send you to hell for bad health. Uh, God sends drunkards to hell. Drunkenness is, in the Bible, called drunkenness. It's not called alcoholism. But the abuse of alcohol, the body can develop a improper uh, dependence and desire for that. And so there, an addiction develops through sinful abuse. We don't abuse it because we're addicts. We become addicts through the abuse. You see the distinction? Now, life dominating sins, alcohol, drugs, pornography, uh, would be three of the things that probably plague us most, most in our culture uh, today. Um, God in his sovereignty delivers people out of these at different uh, speeds. Uh, sometimes it's immediately broken. Other times he leaves a period of struggle. Homosexuality would be a fourth that uh, would be a life dominating sin. And um, God will then, the dominion's broken, the person has been freed from that and they do not have to do it. The, the chain of addiction in that sense is broken, but the struggle remains in various levels with different people. And so we work with them and we recognize that there will be uh, lapses. Uh, there can be, in any of those areas, there can be lapses. But with that lapses accompanied, and the difference now is not with remorse, but with a genuine 
uh, grief and sorrow over that sin. And as our catechism says, a full purpose and endeavor after new obedience. And so repentance and confession and strengthening and moving forward. So the dominion is broken, which means there's always going to be godly sorrow and repentance, and it's going to become less frequent. Pastly, though, we need to be patient with people uh, in those life-dominating sins. You need to build a support group. Uh, when I preach on things like pornography, I say, you know, you want to think you can do this on your own. You can't. Yes, the Spirit's powerful, but you need accountability. And life-dominating sins all need accountability. And we need the church, the body of Christ. That's why God put us in this family and not Lone Ranger Christians. And so we'll come out at different speeds, but the person who invariably falls back into the life dominating sin and has remorse but no real repentance and is not a less frequent falling back, that's the person that will need to be challenged if they've truly been born again. First, and you actually asked this question about four weeks ago, didn't you? Five weeks ago. So, uh, you remember the answer then? No. Uh, first, remorse is not sufficient. Remorse is not sufficient. Remorse is not repentance. Remorse is godly sorrow. Remorse is feeling sorry for myself. So, the first thing I'm looking for is a genuine, I have offended the God who has saved me. I have dishonored the Christ who died on the cross for me. And I am broken hearted over that. That becomes a much more powerful uh, spiritual thing than, oh, woe am I, I've done it again. Or, I know I'm wrecking my life, or I'm wrecking my family, or, or whatever. So we're looking for godly repentance, godly sorrow, as Paul will define it for 2 Corinthians 7. Uh, so second, it's not our duty to give assurance. So we keep bringing them back to the grace of the gospel Say, rest in Christ and seek power in Christ. Uh, and God will eventually deliver you from this if you're in Christ. Uh, but uh, it's the Spirit who will give them assurance and not I. Okay, and then my second question, the other flip side of the coin is, now that man is married, now imagine that man is married, and he, he is one of these people church that he's in uh, maybe is like a kind of boys would be boys kind of attitude towards it or like oh but they have a, a, a like as you said earlier a weaker view of sanctification so it's kind of like well in this life we're not all perfect so wife you just need to bear up under it so the wife is under the authority of the church she's under the authority of her husband but her husband is in this remorseful continuing of sin what do you say to that? That's the kind of question you asked before. That you asked before. before. And it's a gen weeks ago. Oh. <laughs> and it's a genuinely important question. No, I'm, I'm glad it comes up again. But it's so important. And there's no simple answer to the question. The first thing it reminds us of for ourselves and for others, be careful what church you go into in the first place. And again, uh, this parallels uh, sonship, where you've got churches where there's no uh, genuine church discipline, you've got no fault divorce or fault divorce, and nobody's been disciplined uh, in the church. Um, I can almost say pornography is a, is a, a fad with sonship. I mean, invariably. You'll hear these guys, and then they'll say really stupid things like, yeah, yeah you know, I, I understand. Uh, uh, I, I wrestle with this pornography. Uh, in our Presbytery, you wouldn't be wrestling with pornography in the 
be licensed or ordained, and if you were, you'd be at least admonished and put on some temporary. Uh, and the same, and I hope that every one of you men with your mentor, uh, everybody's supposed to ask you once a semester, uh, have you wrestled with pornography this semester? Because it is important. It is a sin that is plaguing the church. And now, the statistics that I've seen, women almost as much as men. So, uh, so that, that's the first place. You, you, you put yourself in a very bad situation. Now, all right, so her husband put her into that situation, which makes it you know, even more complex and difficult. Um, let, let me finish Zach before I lose my entire train of consciousness if you don't mind I'm getting ready to say something that's quite controversial uh, in a good church if this were going on and the man submitted to counsel and refused to repent kept following the pattern of behavior I would say she has grounds for divorce I call it sexual immorality I will tell her that in a bad church. If her husband, now I also happen to believe that she has to have the church's permission to get a divorce, uh, which makes it more difficult. But if her husband is an impenitent uh, pornographer, uh, he is violating his marriage vows, he's committing adultery. The word that Christ uses is sexual immorality. Um, I would say, and I've actually counseled a session on this a number of years ago, um, but that was a good session. They take the men through the paces, and he still wouldn't repent. Uh, but um, I would, uh, I would say she has grounds for divorce. So my question is not so much over whether she has grounds for divorce. And the reason I ask this is because I know a number of women who are in this exact situation, uh, in in one form or another. And the question is more because I am not in a position to say whether it's the church, as you said, who needs to tell her that, but when she's in, and I and I understand that be careful what church you go to, but she's already there. When it's that situation, what do you tell, I mean, what do you tell the woman? What do you... First Peter 3. She's married to an unbeliever, and she's trying to win in by her quiet and gentle spirit of prayers of godliness. Not by harping. She's not his conscience. Uh, and so... He might think he's a Christian, but she treats him as a non-Christian spouse and follows First Peter 3. Harping's not good. Nagging's not good. Um, she just needs to be a quiet, submissive, and gentle wife and pray for him. Even though the church is saying something completely different, her church. And what do they say? I mean, like the church, so, so the situation would be like this. I'm going to take one specific situation. The situation is like this. The church says, oh, tisk tisk, you shouldn't be doing that. It's exactly what you just said, the situation of, oh, I know your struggle. I know that struggle. Tisk tisk, you shouldn't be doing that. You need accountability. Um, it doesn't matter. She treats him as a non-Christian. She can treat the whole church as non-Christian. <laughs> She's in it, though. But she treats her husband as a non-Christian. She doesn't have to say that to him. But she begins to follow the model of First Peter 3. Prayerful submission, obedience, gentle spirit, and uh, leave him in the hands of the Lord. That's her only. And protect your children. Now, if he's leaving his stuff around and exposing the children to it, she has to leave him. I, won't, I don't need the church to tell me that. If he's exposing my children to pornography, uh, to encourage them or expose it. Huh? That's right. I mean, you, you can leave your children to a man that's going to encourage you to read pornography or look at your food. No, but I mean, as in separation or as in divorce? Because some people, I mean, the Well, I, I, I'm talking about separation at this point. If that doesn't wake him up, well then. But yeah, I mean, I wouldn't leave my children in that home, is what I'm saying. It's the same as abuse. But I'm not saying he, he's exposed. I, I, you know, I hear the stories. I talk to my guys and uh, their fathers would leave, this was pre-computer age, leave the magazines lying around the house. I mean, was there any mother want her ch child living in that kind of environment? I mean, she could ask him, please, do
do not expose my children to these things. And if he refuses, she says, you know, I will have to live under a separate roof if you're going to expose my children to these things. And I will get a court order. You cannot come around them uh, because of this. But that's what it comes to. But I don't think she takes the victim mentality. I mean, if it's just he, he's an unbeliever, regardless of what he thinks or what the church thinks. We know what the Bible says, and so that's how she would treat him. She wouldn't leave him. Um, but uh, if he continued in sexual immorality and she was in a church that would allow her to divorce him, then I think she should divorce him. Which might be his wake up call. Now that's broader, and usually I'm never on the broader side of, of most issues, and that's broader than some, <laughs> some people. But I'm, I'm really convinced that that is sexual immorality. And same as he's a gambler and not supporting the family or he's uh, hurting them physically or whatever. The law says that a husband is responsible to give his wife uh, conjugal rights, uh, lodging, food, protection. And if he's not doing those things, then he's deserved her as far as I'm concerned. The confession does say we don't do this on our own. We must have either the consent of the state or the church. It's too easy to get consent of the state these days. So. Is there a hand over there? Maybe something for later, but I think it's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. A church that's not practicing one of the marks of the church, she has no recourse to join another church? That is she could ask her husband's permission, but... Um, so obedience in the Lord doesn't entail anything in terms of true gospel churches? Well, again, lack of discipline, or at least a consistent discipline, probably would make it no church. It would make it a very unhealthy place to be. So something we'll touch now, if it were a cult or whatever, then no, she should not go. Just a minute. Oh, that's right. I put you off all ago, Mr. Dodson. Go ahead. Oh, it's my... Okay. Uh, being as I'm from Wise County, Virginia, I have a question. I have struggled with an addiction early in my adult life, and that is to the uh, oral tobacco product. And I am just curious, if somebody comes in my church and they dip skull. Is that a life-dominating sin? Or should I just be like, well, it's okay, you dip skull. I mean, it, the church I belong to in college, I had a ruling elder that used to dip skull in service. So I'm just, I'm curious, is a nicotine addiction, does that constitute a life-altering or life-dominating sin? Uh, we're, I don't know that we're in a position to accuse a person of addiction. Uh, Christian liberty would allow a man to dip skull uh, because the Bible does not forbid dipping skull. And nicotine, in fact, is very good for you. As in all things, it shouldn't be abused. <laughs> but uh, actually, doctors use nicotine patches if a person is not a moderate smoker to treat a number, and particularly in men, of, uh, of illnesses. And so it's not the skull, it's not the tobacco, it's the, it's the t chemicals in cigarettes that are dangerous. That, harm a person's health. Now, if you use skull too much, you might get a really bad case of lip cancer. But I'm not in the position to tell a person he is addicted to tobacco if he dips regularly. Now, what I do, what I encourage people to do, I smoke a pipe. And I will go periodically uh, for a number of days and not smoke the pipe. And that's simply a check. Uh, I can even miss it but I don't have to have it. Um, the same would be true with uh, alcohol, coffee, Coca-Cola, whatever your thing is. Uh, and so it's not that we may not use these things, but we're to be mastered by nothing but the Lord. So if a man is being mastered by Coca-Cola, well, I've seen as many people mastered by Coca-Cola to have cigarettes. Mastered by Coca-Cola, then he needs to bring that uh, to Christ and uh, seek moderation in all things. But moderation is the key, not forbidding the use. Um, only you can know whether you were addicted or just enjoyed it. Um, 
and that is a decision between you and your God. Uh, I can't lay out for you um, how many dips a day are too much. Uh, first time I chewed. I, mean, I would say I was addicted because if I went three right. days without it, I was pretty bad. Uh, three days. You could go three days without it. I could, but I'd be grouchy as a sore tail cat. Oh. <laughs> what? Okay. <laughs> so, th that's your conscience. So what I'm trying to say is, you cannot legislate that for an elder in the church. You must leave each man's conscience at that point uh, before God. That's, that's really what I'm trying to say. So you can judge for yourself. And if you reach that determination, then either you cut back in moderation, which is, and mortification would say at this point, you pluck out your eye or your bottom lip um, if you cannot do it without having to do it. But you don't legislate that for somebody else. Does that help? Oh, yes, sir, it does. I, I had to quit, and now I just use it moderately because my insurance plan says I can only use it moderately. And let me tell you, a lower premium is a big influence to quit. But you can use it moderately. And the same thing with, uh, say, uh, the abuse of alcohol. This uh, trip, double A, that's the car place, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, that you, uh, you can never uh, touch alcohol again. So every day you say, I'm an alcoholic and all that. Well, I know plenty of men who have been converted who abused alcohol who now can drink in moderation. There are others who know that they shouldn't do that because they've not yet grown to a place and they might never grow to the place where they can do that. But again, we don't, the principle is mortification. So if this thing is going to cause me to stumble, then I don't do it. It, it doesn't have to be a... a uh, a thing like that, it can, it can be something absolutely innocent for other people. I have a friend uh, that I was discipling back when I was in seminary in my first church, and he was a, he's about 10 years older than I am, maybe not quite that, and he, uh, uh, he was a, uh, a rabid Ole Miss football fan. He never went to Ole Miss. <laughs> but he was, anyway, and so he would go to a football game, and he was actually by the students, uh, title the most obnoxious fan. So he, as he was growing, he realized, I cannot go to an Ole Miss football game because I'm going to dishonor Christ. And so he cut that out of his life, perfectly innocent thing for most people, uh, until he grew to a point that he could go to a football game and behave. He didn't legislate that for anybody else. You see the difference? That's the important principle of mortification. Some temperamental sins, I, I'm a very placid personality, but I do, I have known a Christian who really struggled with things like a fierce temper, and in their unconverted days, they would just fly off the hand right. at the slightest thing, and then once they become believers, they manage for a time to control yep. it, and then all of a sudden, flares up, mm -hmm. they already struggle with that inability to control, to restrain their temper. And it can be very discouraging in the Christian life because you think you're getting to a certain point and you're actually managing this thing and then all of a sudden situation arises and it flares up and you feel as though you're just back at square one. So how does, how does sanctification work with temperamental sins like that? Exactly the same way. And you encourage them, well, you know, look, you know, you, you don't do it as often. Um, they need a good Christian counselor to encourage them then when they do um, blow the top. I mean, isn't that why we have the qualifications for the eldership? I mean, is Paul pretty realistic what's going to be in the church? And two terms, uh, be peaceful, which actually is not, uh, don't be pugnacious and don't be given to war. <laughs> Will be gentle. Now, if those are elder qualifications, we all to aspire for them, but what Paulus recognizes is going to be some men in the church that are not yet there. And so that is the place where we 
mortify the flesh, you know, what are the things that cause me to lose my temper? Um, the idiots I live around or whatever. <laughs> uh, but it can be impatience, uh, whatever. And what we're looking for are baby steps. And they need to understand that, that uh, um, we're, you know, we're growing and uh, we can look back in our life and see that, yes, I have less temper now than I had, I had before. I was wondering if there's a connection somewhere with uh, God testing men. Uh, I don't see any except for maybe temptation. Well, when we get to the chapter on perseverance, we'll, we'll come back to, to that. Of, of, yeah. Perseverance. Yeah. If God will test us as well uh, in temptation at times. Now, uh, there's another experience that I've dealt with pastorally. We last is I. I guess he meant you get a dip. <laughs> you can dip in class. <laughs> Can't dip on the airplane anymore. Now they've got smokeless tobacco forbidden as well as uh, uh, the other things. So. Uh, you live in a free world. Uh, <laughs> your question. Right? You said right. you were thinking of a specific example. Pastoral, oh, pastoral example you were just dealing with. Thank you. Um, I know of situations where a person has come out of one of these sins. Uh, maybe he was really a, a, a terrible blasphemer. And uh, are, uh, you know, committed to pornography, sexual morality, whatever, and has gone on and, and maybe for years uh, walked with the Lord and suddenly Satan fills his mind with all those blasphemous thoughts and words or with all those pictures that he thought that he had been released from. And that is an attack of Satan to cause us to stumble. I think it might be what the confession means when we talk about assurance, sudden temptation. The sudden temptation that can cause a person to lose assurance is this suddenly these images of the past fill my mind. And how in the world can I be in Christ and uh, think about God in that manner? I really think that are suggestions of Satan. And so you have to have people with that as well. I think it's past break time, isn't it? So having fun. All right, uh, 10 minutes. Now, the extent of sanctification, I've already read paragraphs two and three, so it's throughout the whole person. So it's not one aspect of, of me that's being sanctified. For example, the fruit of the Spirit is fruit. Uh, it's all mine to some degree uh, are to be in our lives. Uh, and so uh, mind, affections, body, uh, everything should be affected by <clears throat> sanctification. But then it, we see realistically that it's imperfect in this life and there's a continual civil war. It's okay! <laughs> Actually, I think you're right on the money, Fabio. I just was so anxious to get started. that uh, You're all right. He didn't do like Mr. Dotson and Lee before the break. <laughs> but he's nervous. Had I known that you were about to take a break, I wouldn't have left. Well, that was past time. You can ask for it. I, I, apologize. I guess you could say Fabio and I are like pretty, pretty similar. No, you leave early, he comes in late. <laughs> and you're dipping in my class. I didn't think I would notice. <laughs> I, uh, what I really I, like are my, is my uh, online students that sit in their home and smoke a pipe in my class when I can't smoke one on campus or in the, in the classroom. So. Anyway, so uh, to the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate part doth overcome. And so saints grow in grace, perfected holiness in the fear of God. 
We're never going to be left in a position by God who's promised that what he's begun in us will bring to completion. It will be painfully slow, more in some of us than others. But there is going to be, it's not going to be a, uh, a graph. <clears throat> what does that little black pen go? I'll tell you all my tablet went to put there. Uh, a guy in the uh, airport somewhere and he turned it on and there was this all these colored lines come out. I thought the screen was broken. There's actually a digital thing that's right in the middle of this. That is how everything works with the words and the pictures and all that. And that broke. Anyway. That was the other frustrating part. So, um, with its sanctification like that. Sanctification is more like that. So the general course of life is progression. But there's going to be declines and plateaus. But there's going to be more progression. And the progressions will invariably go higher and last longer. But the other thing that happens in sanctification, let's say you're out in the uh, field there in uh, southern Alabama, you've been bird hunting with Nate Ethan, and uh, you're coming in and you uh, look at yourself, oh, I didn't get too many today. And that's good. A little closer to the house and the lights. Oh, I see, I, I got a little bit of more mud on me than I realize. And you walk into the mud room under the bright lights and you're covered in mud. And that's the Christian life. Actually, the more we grow and the more we come in conformity to Christ, the more of our sin uh, we'll be aware of. And the more it's going to be heart sins, not the outward acts of sin. And more and more our focus will then be on our hearts and the wickedness of our hearts. And the more we grow, the more aware we're going to be of, of those things. But we do so with confidence that we're pressing on. Well, then we've got this remarkable discussion in Larger Catechism 77 that is so useful. We're into justification and sanctification differ. Although sanctification be inseparably joined, so there it is again, inseparably joined with justification, yet they differ in that God in justification imputeth righteousness of Christ. In sanctification, his spirit infuseth grace, enableth to the exercise thereof. In the former, justification, sin is pardoned. In the other, sanctification, it is subdued. The one doth equally free all believers from the revenging wrath of God. And that perfectly in this life, we think that they never fall into condemnation. The other is neither equal in all, nor in this life perfect in any, but growing up to perfection. Very useful. Did you get her tickled again, Bobby? <laughs> or is Ethan picking on her? No, you're just... You better quit sitting by him, huh? You know these Brazilian men. You're married to one. <laughs> uh, Beautiful contrast here for us. So, uh, what's the uh, first contrast? Uh, imputation of the righteousness of Christ versus uh, grace. Okay. So, imputation, you'll remember from our discussion of that, is a reckoning. It is a, a legal act, or we could actually refer to it as an economic act. It is uh, linear. It is... Uh, purely a reckoning on God's part uh, where he imputes to us, puts to our moral bank account the perfect righteousness of Christ uh, by which we are legally righteous in our sins of pardon. Sanctification is the infusion of grace. 
And that's different from Romanism, which is the infusion of righteousness. You see, this is the grace that the Spirit's at work in us, enabling us then to uh, die to sin. And so uh, grace is given to us, and grace here is with the power of Christ purchased by Him and by His Spirit worked into our lives, enabling us then to exercise grace. What's the second contrast? Yes, sir. The, the pardoning of sins versus the subduing of okay. its power over you. So sin is pardoned in justification, but uh, sin is being subdued in <laughs> sanctification. And the third... And delivered from the punishment uh, of sin equal and full in all believers. Sanctification is a growing in perfection, but not equal in all or perfect in this life. So there's a completion, uh, a fullness in justification. Uh, there is imperfection uh, and actually varied growth. And it's very important to keep this in mind as well. So... Surely you've seen uh, the examples, perhaps even in your own family. You've got uh, uh, two children. Um, one is uh, crawling, not walking, at uh, nine or ten months old and talking in full sentences. That was my daughter. She liked that cartoon where the baby was crawling around with a blanket and uh, uh, Popeye uh, talking full sentences. And the other one uh, is walking at 10 months old, doesn't talk till he's two, um, which would be a great relief to some mothers. <laughs> and you might be tempted to say that one child was uh, going to have some learning problems to be inferior to the other. No. That physically God does this, and you either have more than one child, know that. Uh, and. Uh, so it's not the same in each one. Their development, their physical development, their mental development, their reading, whatever, uh, can all vary. That's exactly what God does in us spiritually as well. So we're not cookie-cutter Christians that we all are marching uh, uh, link step uh, at the same level of progress. And it's a very important that you don't measure yourself by others. We measure ourselves by Christ and the law, we're all going to do very poorly. So that's, that's enough self-examination. Uh, you know, we can admire the progress of others. We can want to emulate them in certain areas. When you read Christian biography, and you remember as well, a, a biography of 300 pages is not going to be a very exhaustive account of uh, 70 years. Um, and so even then in Christian biography, you don't really get the, the full picture. And so we can uh, emulate and admire and have patterns, but not to compare ourselves or to say that I want to be like this or that. Because God's working in each of us at different paces. And it's important that we humble ourselves and seek Him then in that process. All right. You ready? Yes, sir. So what would you say then is the difference mainly between, uh, so I was reading Patristics the other day, I think it was St. John of Damascus or Cyril of Alexandria was writing on a theosis of the doctrine of... Okay. okay. So what would you say is the difference between our view of sanctification and a view like the... Well, aren't we glad that we got Ethan and Zach in here to use all these good words? They're nerds and talk too much, yeah. So, uh, you actually behave fairly well now. So... Peter says in 1 Peter 1 So in verse 8 Though you have not seen him, you will love him and though you do not see him now, but believe in him you greatly rejoice with joy and express in full glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of of your souls. That's not exactly what I'm looking for. Um, 
earlier. Uh, blessed, verse 3, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven. We're protected by the power of God through faith to salvation to be revealed at the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while it's necessary you've been distressed by various trials. So the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, um, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you've not seen him now, believe in him, you greatly rejoice. Uh, I'm still not finding what I want. Uh, Peter promises us that we will, in fact, uh, maybe it's Second Peter one is the reason I'm not finding it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Verse 4. For by these he's, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So what does Peter mean that by these promises that we will become partakers of the divine nature? Theosis There's the Eastern Orthodox and to a degree the Roman Catholic doctrine that uh, in the beatific vision we are going to see God and we are going to uh, have this divine nature imparted to us. It happens in different ways according to the system of the mystics or whatever. Um, is that what Peter is saying here? Well, no. Uh, we cannot participate in the divine nature. The divine nature is in fact immutable, infinite and eternal. But we will participate in the divine moral nature, which the Bible very consistently bears testimony to. So we're not going to reflect a divine nature in us ontologically, but morally. So the Greek Orthodox are really keen on this. That's the goal of salvation. That's also why they say, I think I mentioned this when we were there, that um, Christ would have become incarnate even if we, Adam had not sinned. Because the whole, he's the pattern of our being made men and women in the divine nature. Okay? Yes, sir? Uh, if, so sanctification is by the Holy Spirit, and it's, you know, it's his work in that throughout. And you, and you said that sanctification takes place at different rates for different people. How do we avoid or, or help people avoid getting frustrated or overwhelmed with the lack of speed of their sanctification and avoid them blaming the Holy Spirit or something of saying, like, why aren't you sanctifying me faster? I can't help myself. I need you to help me, and it doesn't seem to be happening. Well, I think it's fine to pray that kind of bold prayer. <laughs> right. I can't do this if you don't do it in me. Right. Plead with you to work more quickly. Um, we encourage them with the fact that it is God that's at work in them, and and moreover, we encourage them by reminding yes, we repent of all of our sins. The fact that sanctification is at different paces does not excuse any of us uh, of our sin. And so we mourn our sin, we confess our sin, we plead with God to sanctify us. We particularly lay out the issues. For example, when you come to the Lord's table, this is not done as it ought to be, you need to be coming intentionally Thinking about, here's some things I'm really asking God now to nourish me and correct me in, particularly matters of affection and stuff like that. And so you're taking hold of Christ in the supper and pleading with God to give you these things in the supper. And so we teach people how to use the means of grace, not simply do so mechanically. All right. Then the benefits of... Uh, Justification, adoption, and sanctification. Um, 36. The benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification are assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Spirit, perseverance in grace, and increase, increase in grace and perseverance therein to the end. These are glorious realities that belong to us that we ought to be enjoying as Christians because we are recipients of these acts and of this work. So sanctification is an internal transformation of our character. How does it manifest itself? 
It manifests itself then in good works. So we go to chapter 16, and we look at what the confession has to say then about good works. And we begin then with the um, definition in paragraphs 1 and 2. Good works are only such as God hath commanded in his holy word, not such as without the warrant thereof are devised by men out of blind zeal or upon any pretense of good intention. These good works done in obedience to God's commandments are the fruits and evidences of a true and lively faith, and by them believers manifest their thankfulness strengthen their assurance, edify their brethren, adorn the profession of the gospel, stop the mouths of adversaries, and glorify God, whose workmanship they are created in Christ Jesus thereunto. And having their fruit unto holiness, they may have the end, eternal life. Beautiful, isn't it? So we begin by pointing out that uh, good works are only defined by God. Only things commanded in Scripture. Don't smoke, don't chew, don't date girls that do are not good works. <laughs> they might be wise advice, but to abstain uh, are not good works. And so it actually says, not devised by men, uh, either out of blind zeal or good intent. Both these things are at work. So, um, the, there's, legalism has two expressions. Uh, one is I'm trying to earn God's acceptance by my behavior. That's legalism. The other is I'm trying to live by man-made laws. That's legalism. Both are a denial of grace and the sufficiency of Scripture. It's very important you understand this. You know, I really couldn't care less whether a person drank in moderation or not, but I get really, really offended when their church tells them it's a sin to drink in moderation. Because what have they done? They've added to Scripture. Now their argument would be, well, drunkenness is a problem in our age, and uh, thus we should abstain. They are to divine the sufficiency of Scripture. That God is unable to lead and guide and direct his people by his word. And so Christ actually shows the awful sinfulness of these good intentions or blinded zeal in Mark chapter 7 when his disciples are called to account for eating with unwashed hands, which meant they had not done ceremonial cleansing. Uh, Would he uh, says, um, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, verse 6, as it's written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. <clears throat> Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. And I think it's Matthew that actually builds the progression in Matthew chapter 15, his account of the same instance. So that's where he gives the example that uh, uh, they um, forbid people uh, to take care of their parents by uh, saying this is Corbin, which would kind of be what we would call a living trust today. That you put money in living trust and then you say to your parents, I don't have any money to help you with. Uh, so you put this in the trust and they live out of it, the church get what left over. Um, so first he says, you invalidate the word of God by your tradition. And then he says, um, uh, no, let me back up. Yeah, so you invalidate the word of God, and then he says, you make it null. Um, and maybe that's in, in, in Mark 7. I thought both instances were in uh, Mark uh, 7, where he says, uh, you, neg you neglect it and you invalidate it. Um, verse yeah, six. verse 8, you neglect it. 
And then he goes on and he says, in verse 13, you invalidate the word. So it begins by neglecting the word. At the end of the day, you've replaced the word uh, with man-made laws. And so what do you find? You find often in these circles, let's just take one example, the Lord's Day. A very low view of the Lord's Day. They've got their external measures, measurements of what is acceptable to God, and they're neglecting uh, Scripture. Well, that's, uh, that's also very complex, and your role is different uh, in, in that in about three different ways. Um, the church may not bind your conscience. So if they say it's a sin, uh, then you cannot submit to the church because it's a sin. Um, and they should not be legislating. And they could say, we think it's not wise to drink. Uh, the second thing is you wouldn't flaunt your liberty then so that uh, you, if you used alcohol, you would not do it in public. You would uh, be very careful. That's not being a hypocrite. When I, for the longest time when I pastored in a little town in Mississippi, uh, I would buy beer out of town and never drink in public. But uh, the more, I mean, you know, I was dealing with a lot of unconverted people. I, I, one guy, on the liquor store, and he's, I've witnessed to him, he says, Preacher, would you be offended if I gave you a, a bottle of whiskey for Christmas? <laughs> so it didn't bother non-Christians, you see. Uh, and then people in my church also. But you just have to be careful where you are and not uh, give unnecessary offense. Now, that's not what the Bible means by the stumbling block. The stumbling block is uh, Joe over here thinks it's a sin to drink, and you are almost compelling him to drink. Uh, act against his conscience. That's the sin. Uh, now the third thing is, you have no authority, so you're right. But if somebody asks you what you thought about uh, the moderate use of alcohol, you're free to answer that question, but not free to try to change the pattern of the church. Just a minute. When we speak of the regulative principle of worship, we affirm that not only may you not do what God has forbidden, but you may not do anything that God has not expressly commanded. Is that same principle reflected here in terms of all of life that we may only no, do? No, I think it's not. I think we have a pattern in uh, the uh, synodical letter in Acts 15. There were things that the church ask them not to do for a period of time for the sake of peace. They weren't binding their conscience. They just said, so they had a moral thing in there about uh, fornication. But they also had, don't eat meat offered to idols, which Paul will later himself change. Uh, and don't uh, eat blood. Uh, one more. Uh, the animal with the charge. Strength. Yeah. So, the church was able not to, these were not laws to bind the conscience, but they were church principles for the sake of peace at that particular period of time. <coughs> Even the church may do that, but never bind the conscience in, in, in doing that. And we know they may do it, but they did it, and then later on the Bible, as the church grows, for example, Paul will give different principles to govern people uh, with, with regard to that. So I, I oh, wait a Mr. Dotson, you are next. I, I have a doozy of a question, Dr. Piper. You're speaking about we can't follow in the traditions of men. Do we, do we think our forefathers were guilty of this, for example, when Moses Hoth said, I've never seen a religious man frequenting a theater, or Benjamin Morgan Palmer 
threatened to resign from First Church because he wouldn't be a pastor of a quote-unquote dancing church? Yeah. No, I think they got carried away by the culture at those points. Now, we got to realize as well, in the context, the plays were body. And the scriptures, the standards, I think when the standards deal with chastity in the, in the larger catechism exposition, they talk about body plays. I don't think any of these men had a problem with uh, Shakespeare or something like that. Uh, as to the dancing church, you know, what kind of dancing were they doing? Uh, but if he simply didn't want to pastor a church that allowed dancing, that was his liberty as well. But he didn't have the liberty to tell people not to dance at, the, say, the English country dance or whatever. That there's nothing lascivious about that. Uh, so yeah, we all are, we all have feet of play, and, and we all can make make mistakes with regard to that. <clears throat> I had read that the Princeton the president of Princeton, sometime in the 1800s, during the temperance movement. <clears throat> had a habit of always drinking strong drink, even though he hated strong drink, when he was around Methodist ministers at gatherings <laughs> to rub it in their face. What do we take it, what do we make of that? Well, that's like Mr. Donaldson's question. That's not something that uh, I would encourage. <laughs> not a strong drink, but where you do it. <laughs> no, we have to, uh, we to be gentle. And uh, <coughs> kind and patient, and don't let our freak flag fly. <laughs> what about my positive bonds like the dietary code? That's been fulfilled. It's quite clear, for example, in Acts uh, that God said, We may now say that no food is unclean. So if a person on his own wants to avoid food that was condemned by the dietary laws, he's free to do so, but never to make it a religious principle or a sign of marked holiness. Uh, he might be convinced it's more healthy. So, uh, vegan, how do you say the word? Or vegan? 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 I've heard all kinds of anyway. Vegan? What is it, Howie? You work in these other books. Vegan? Vegan, vegetable, vegan, it should be a soft G. Anyway, those that simply do it because of their own system or they think it's more healthy, normally not to eat, but you know, if you've got some convoluted view that it's wrong to eat flesh, that's a sin. Because God said to give us all things to eat. So again, motive becomes a very important issue with respect to things uh, like that, what a person does or refrains from doing. So if they're doing that religious principle, then you gotta push back, you gotta challenge them. And so I'm always asking that question with somebody, well now, why? I don't come, you know, or is it, you know why don't you eat uh, flesh? Well, I don't like it, I don't like its taste, or I don't think it's good for me. And that's as far as they go, that's their liberty. But then they must not judge my liberty for the 10 ounce steak that I'm eating as I'm sitting there beside them. Oh, no, 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 no. There's no... What if a weak brother The weaker brother is the person who has a conscience issue. But if, they got a, if they're eating a dietary law out of conscience issue, they place themselves under what Paul says, the elementary principles in the bondage. He says, no man is to be your judge with respect to food. So I would, I would not give it to them at all. But is it okay for us to eat Happily eat in front of these yeah. <laughs> Then you've got to make a point, for sure. Because then you've got a clear biblical principle. That God says, He says you can drink all things too. But I just, there's a bit of difference there in terms of the bondage they're under. Are there wrong? Hey, Dr. Patrick. So, with, in that same vein, would you be okay with drinking in front of somebody? Well, it depends. If I can do that in, in a certain situation and they understand, 
that they don't want to and it's fine if I do. Uh, and I'm not trying to compel their conscience. It depends on that point. And normally I'm not going to do that in front, deliberately in front of a fundamentalist. Um, but I might do it, I mean, in, in Greenville, with the, the culture that's here, I still, I'll order wine in a restaurant. I mean, nobody knows I am anyway. But, uh, now, if they said to, to me, what does Paul say? Then you know that's, that's wine. Yeah, it is. And Jesus made good wine. <laughs> this is not as good as what he made. But, uh, you know, if they asked me not to, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't. But uh, not for sake of conscience. It's just wisdom and charity. Um, if we have people over from the seminary, I'll ask them ahead of time, will you be offended? For example, we've had Koreans, and Koreans are much more strict than the IBP. So I've asked them, I said, Do you, would you prefer me not to serve wine at dinner? And if they said we would rather not, then that would take care of it. And they said we don't care, well then that takes care of it. Yes, sir, you're, you're always quiet up there, so I'll give you plenty of time. Um, for those of us who come from uh, cultures that love blood sausage, I assume... Oh, I love blood sausage. <laughs> I love black pudding, excuse me. Yes. Um, I assumed that the idea of not eating anything with blood was a noetic uh, command, and hence was for all times. Is that incorrect? I don't find it in Noah at all. I find it only in the ceremonial law. And so thus it was repeated for the sake of peace in the church. But it's along with the other two laws that were for the sake of peace in the church, trying to keep the Jew and Gentile together. and has, after the destruction of the temple, no binding uh, effect. I just had some black pudding last uh, Thursday morning. Did that help you? Yes, thanks. I mean, you might be squeamish about it, but uh, it tastes like sausage. It's, uh, it does. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that that is the issue, that uh, the church, this started with the question, could the church lay down other regulations? Yes, for the sake of, of peace in the church for a period of time, if they do not make them moral issues. Uh, and they're temporary at that point then in the life of the church. And it really would fall under the elders' prerogative to say we're going to worship at 9.30 and not at 11. So if that's what the elders supposed to make those decisions in wisdom have decided, then we all are to uh, uh, you know, submit to that as long as they're not saying that 9.30 is, is more holy than 11. Um, more people might be able to stay awake at 9, 30, and 11, but uh, y'all are asleep. Okay. That was a joke. But what do you do in a church where you have a number of perhaps former fundamentalists that don't want to drink wine in the Lord's Supper? Is it wise to offer grape juice? Wise, no, but kind, yes. <laughs> you know, I, uh, particularly when a church changes, uh, I think I encourage churches to put a few cups of uh, grape juice in the tray. And when I do the Lord's Supper, I say this is here for those of you who in conscience, do not want to compel them against conscience, uh, cannot drink wine, but we encourage you to take wine because that's what Christ has appointed to be used, and it has theological significance. So that's why I say, you know, wisdom... <clears throat> They're, you're, they're losing lessons that Christ has appointed, but kindness or forbearance wouldn't want them not taking. Um, I've read that Warfield would never take the Lord's Supper uh, in a church that served grape juice. Now, I think that went too far as well. But uh, so my wife, who has this great uh, far side sense of humor, when we were in a former church with this dear young thing. Um, who has, they have grape juice. She said, why don't we ask the elders to put a few cups of wine in the tray for those who good conscience can't use grape juice. <laughs> 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 
But that didn't happen. No, we didn't have this. <laughs> there were enough troublemakers <laughs> as it were. No, we started with a very good question, and that was, we're on the matter of good works, and what may the church require that goes beyond Scripture? So as long as it's not out of, and I'll come back to you, these two caveats, um, Blind zeal are pretense of good intention. So blind zeal is, oh, we all got to do this to serve the Lord. Or, you know, alcoholism is a danger in our society, and so we just want to protect you from yourself. So that goes against mortification. So if my friend who couldn't go to a football game said, Piper, you can't go to a football game now because it causes people to sin. I said, I would say No. Causes you to sin, you shouldn't go, but you don't legislate for me. So that's the blind zeal or the good intention. But if the if the intention is of a higher end, not of holiness, but of peace in the church for a period of time, uh, then I think that'd be very different. So that's how we got off. It wasn't really a rabbit. I think it was very useful. At least I, I thought it was useful. Was it useful? My little fundamentalist friend over there. Yeah, I'm not a fundamentalist. <laughs> I know you're not. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tease you. I wouldn't tease you if you were a fundamentalist. No, I do, I do have a question, though. Well, let me go back to Caleb first, and then we'll come to you. I guess it's early. So uh, my question is, as we've been talking about good, uh, uh, not sinning against conscience and things like that, um, my question is, if, if someone has been persuaded a, away from one of these blind zeal, or like, yeah. let's say someone's been persuaded uh, that, okay, alcohol isn't a sin, alcohol is okay in moderation, but their conscience still, when they go to drink or to partake of whatever this is, it, it still kind of pricks at them. But they, so cognitively they're saying this is not a sin, but still kind of emotionally they're saying, well, this feels wrong. What would you... Uh, well, then I would, I, I think that at that point they're not violating what's not a faith is sin. And so if, if faith objecting the word of God this is not sin, I will outgrow the uh, emotional uh, problems. Uh, with so they wouldn't be sin. But if in fact they think, I'm not sure it's not sin, right. then they need to get sure. Okay. I, I have a teetotal, like the fact I'm not a fan. I know you are. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't teach you. If you're <laughs> but I do have a question, though. It's people who have um, struggled with um, alcoholism and means that there may be some people there who, for whom that could spark um, a re-igniting yeah. of that sin. Right. So how do you okay. get around that? Well, the first thing is, uh, on the basis of truth, that is a wrong view of alcoholism. And it does deny the wisdom of Christ in Scripture. If he commanded the use of wine, and he knew of all contingencies in all ages, mm -hmm. then for us to reason, well, this might set someone off, we're making ourselves wiser than Christ. So we have to guard against that in the first place. But I don't think anybody gets set off by coming with holy intentions and taking them to the side. But because they might think that and be afraid, I then would have some grape juice there for them. Okay. <laughs> because I really am kind. <laughs> I was just reading uh, paragraph two. It does say uh, stop the mouths of the adversaries. Would that be a situation where you would potentially not want to use wine? No, I think that'd be a bit different. But right, let's go on to paragraph two. Thank you. Anything else? Um, so the function of good works is what we have in paragraph two. These works done in obedience to God's commandments are the fruits and evidences of true and lively faith. So sanctification is internal, and we don't see the heart. So what we see then are the works that's performed from the heart by the Christian. And as we grow in good works, that is a true and evidence of a true and lively faith. Second, their thankfulness uh, uh, no, manifest their thankfulness. So we obey out of thankfulness. 
to God. Strengthen their assurance that as we grow in good works, and that, that's one of the three pillars of assurance, as we'll see. Edify their brethren, because it's an encouragement to one another when we, they see us walking with the Lord in obedience. That is encouragement to them. Adorn the profession of the gospel so that uh, we're not hypocrites. Uh, we are uh, showing the reality of the gospel. And stop the mouths of adversaries, those who say that our Christianity is a sham, uh, that it is the opiate of the common person and all those things. No, good works uh, shut the mouths of gainsayers because they see an outward transformation is taking place in the life of the professor and glorify God, which is the ultimate reason for all things. So he's honored. And then they bring in another passage, uh, Ephesians 2.10, um, whose workmanship they are created in Christ Jesus thereunto, that having their fruit unto holiness, they may have it in eternal life. Once again, you see the relationship of good works to eternal life. You're not going to have the fruit unto eternal life if you are absent of good works in your life because they're the product of sanctification, the sign that you belong to Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see the difference? If I understood you correctly, yes. All right, the uh, performance of good works in paragraph three, their ability to do good works is not at all of themselves, but wholly from the spirit of Christ. So he is the energizer, the producer. So once again, he's the agent of sanctification. That they may be enabled thereunto, beside the graces they've already received, they have Require, there is required an actual influence of the same Holy Spirit to work in them to will and do of his good pleasure. So the psalmist teaches us to pray regularly that God will quicken us, fill us with the Spirit, walk with the Spirit. Those are all commandments that we're simply depending upon the Spirit to quicken us, to hunger for holiness, and to obey. But they're not hereupon to grow negligent as if they were not bound to perform any duty unless upon a special motion of the Spirit, but they ought to be diligent in stirring up the grace of God that is in them. So it's no excuse. I can remember back when some of this stuff was beginning to hit uh, the other seminary out in the West when I was still teaching there, and I was talking to a student who had actually been an intern of mine, and he was basically saying that if, if the Spirit was not moving in him uh, to do certain things of obedience, it would be wrong to do them. Well, do we sin that grace might abound? No. And we do we have two sins rather than one? It's a sin if the Spirit's not, I'm not motivated to do this. But it's another sin if I don't do it. And that's what this is, is pointing out. That it's a sin that I'm not desiring to do this from proper motives and in the power of the Spirit. But I don't refrain from doing it because of that. Yes, ma'am. Then he said, but I felt I need to go back and say yes. And a lot of stories like this of like, oh, I'm walking by this thing, and I just feel I need to go talk to that person. When does that get into, uh, what is the valid question? It's just a matter of conscience. Um, so that if I do that and my conscience smites me and I can do something about it, it's not, it's not wholly one way or the other. But if I wanted to show that man love and, and think that would show him love and I go back in order to love my neighbor, uh, that's not wrong. Um, so, is that what you're asking? So I, was, I, was, I guess I was going off of the quickening of the Holy Spirit. No. Quickening of the Holy Spirit is stirring me up to walk by the law of God and giving me power to do so. Okay, so it's specifically about things that are in right. the spirit. Now, if this is loving my neighbor, and I'm convicted that I, uh, I need to love my neighbor in this way, then what's well, not a faith of sin? If that's what I think. Now, I couldn't tell you to do that. 
but that that's what I really thought I should do out of conscience, and I would do it, but I would never mandate that for someone else. Um, so for, for a Christian, um, if he or she, uh, let's say, doesn't really, doesn't really want to go to the church for whatever reasons, but still he uh, or she feels this is the right thing to do, so he or she just go to the church but without a true desire to go to the church. Is it, a, uh, is it still the right thing for him to do so? Have you always wanted to go to church on Sunday morning? No. Okay. Some, most of the time. I might yeah. <laughs> but would it be a sin not to go? Would it be a sin not to go? Yes. Okay. So, uh, we go confessing. Lord, I know it's a sin. I'm supposed to be glad. And they say to this one of the house of the Lord, my heart is dead. The psalmist says, my soul cleaves to the dust. Uh, and we've all had souls that cleave to the dust. And we confess it. Mm -hmm. We say, now, please help me to have joy. Help me to worship. Help me to do this. But regardless, I'm going to do it. Okay. I mean, it's the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to maybe love your wife sacrificially. I can't imagine that about you. You're Anyway, it might be just once upon a time that you know that, you know, I just don't feel like doing this for her. Uh, but you do it. I mean, there's no, you know, great affection in your heart for doing it, but you do it because you know you ought to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's the least of motivation for obedience, but it's not wrong. Do something because we ought to do it. We prefer to do it because we want to do it. But we're sinners, we don't always want to do it. And so we uh, we still obey. Tagging on to Mark's question, take an example of a parent who has some teen children that maybe don't want to go to church. It would be a double sin uh, to allow them not to go merely because they don't want to. What's the first sin? Well, I guess on the part of the child, it would yeah. be a, a so twice over. It would be a sin on the part of the parent to give in. Don't want to go. Right. Right. Or to think, well, I'm not going to make them go. They don't want to go. And never, they might never want to go again. Well, that doesn't matter. <laughs> I deal with that all the time. Uh, uh, parents say, well, I know that I should make my child go to church. But then they'll, they'll rebel and you know, I want them to be here. And No, you don't want them to be in the house if they're not going to live by biblical rules. You do them no favor. Uh, if they're going to be in the house, then you've got to have biblical house rules. And... Uh, you're really hurting the child if you don't. And would that extend beyond their teen years? So like a kid grows up, moves out, has to come back under their parents' roof for whatever reason. They come back, they're under the rules. Okay. Yeah. I mean, after all, free rent, you can at least go to church. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just think that we need much more of this. I was reading this morning in 1 Timothy 3, you know, and again, managing your household and the deacons managing your children uh, well that's, that's very serious and uh, uh, we need a lot more tough love I think than uh, than what we're seeing I, I know I've been there my son was rebellious but he rebellious he would never he did not want he would not move home <laughs> because he knew if he moved home and we prefer to have him at home Begged him to come home, but he knew if he came home, what would be expected of him. We knew that he truly repented when he called and said, I want to come home. So that was good. Why did you move there? <laughs> That's the first thing I dealt with as a pastor in Houston, people getting promotions and moving without beginning to ask the question, is there a Reformed Church in the area? But forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. You know, I would probably go to an Anglican church where they use the prayer book because you'll be hearing these beautiful biblical prayers and a lot of gospel 
uh, is in those prayers. So that's probably what I would do in that situation. <coughs> or, uh, when, when we camped with the children, there was a particular campground that we really liked up in uh, the east side of Arkansas with a little bitty mountain called Petty Jean. And so we're the only people in the history of the campground that get up and put on our coats, ties, our dresses on Sunday morning, drive down and go to church. And in the mornings, we would go to a liberal Presbyterian church because the worship was good, and I was glad to have my children in that worship. But uh, the lip preaching was really bad. In fact, I left one side, I, taught, I said, you know, you really weren't fair to Calvin that he had some abuse of Calvin quotation. But at night, we go to this independent Baptist church where the worship was horrendous, but that man preached the gospel. And so that was our compromise. Neither church it came near meeting our criteria, but between the two, you got a bit of, of the criteria. So you just have to, but don't stay away. Perfect not the song of yourselves together. But should you become a member? Because that situation is that you're traveling somewhere. But the I would not to... become a member. I would seek permission of my own church to remain on the roll for these reasons. You asked about membership. Yeah, no. So you would stay on the role of your home church because there's really no suitable church to be joined to. Boy, we have fun. These are good questions. All right. So the performance of good works, then we've seen uh, in the first place is out of the work of the Holy Spirit, and we then are to obey regardless. Then the acceptability of good works before God are the next three paragraphs. They who in their obedience attain the greatest height which is possible in this life are so far from being able to supererogate and do more than God requires as that they fall short of much which in duty they are bound to do. Now what in the world does this word supererogate mean and what are they addressing in this paragraph? Bonus points. Huh? Bonus points. Bonus points. That's the way to put it. Roman Catholic bonus points. Uh, so the Roman Catholics have a doctrine called supererogation. And this is how you get to be a saint, you see. That's one of the things you have to have. You've got to have done more good works than you need for yourself not to go to purgatory. And what you do that's extra goes into the treasury. Then the folks who will pay out the money can get some of your good works out of the treasury. Or we can pray to you after you're dead and you can intercede on our behalf. And I'm not exaggerating. So, um, and they have the councils of perfection. These are really the good works. This is part of what probably that first section is addressing. So the vow of chastity, or actually celibacy, we all should vow chastity as long as we're single. Uh, chastity, poverty, and uh, submission to authority. Implicit faith. And so the people that live by the councils of perfection we're super saints. So what happens when a person dies and uh, you're looking at their lifestyle, you're looking at a miracle, they first get the uh, rank one, which is what the beatific rank, and then after a bit of time they can get uh, graduated up to a saint. And the saint means that they've put works in the treasury of merit and uh, they've done sufficient miracles and they now can be intercessors in the church. And this is what 21st century Roman Catholics believe. And the Roman Catholic Church will fall as low as the surrounding culture allows. You guys in the South don't know this. You, see. Um, you see a really pale Roman Catholic Church. In fact, when I was in Mississippi, the Irish priests that came, well, now Mobile is a very Roman Catholic city, so that could be a I was to say, yeah. But in, in Mississippi, these Irish priests were almost evangelical. Or that church out on Woodruff Road, right near uh, Woodruff Road Presbyterian Church. They have Bible studies and youth group. They do all these things. And you can tell the difference in them and evangelical church by their marquee. Um, but uh, then I move up north, and they got a saint under glass downtown in Philadelphia, and my neighbor's telling me how to pray uh, when I lost my car keys. He says, this is what you do. You pray, St. Anthony, St. Anthony, come around. I've lost something that can't be found. And this woman educated woman, had a government job, or maybe that means not educated. Uh, <laughs> believe that! 
Then we go overseas, man, splinters of the cross and Mary's milk and Christ's blood, and, uh, you know, enough, enough wood from the cross to build an ark. <laughs> So they, they, they're going to do it, um, and so that's what super irrigation is all about. Then we cannot, by our best works, merit pardon of sin or eternal life at the hand of God. The other day, we're still unprofitable servants, right? So works in no way merit or earn eternal life by reason of the great disproportion that's between them and the glory to come. It's like trying to pay a bill with Confederate money. Doesn't work. Or monopoly money. And the infinite distance that's between them, between us and God, whom by them we can neither profit nor satisfy for the debt of our former sins, but when we've done all that we can, we've done but our duty and are unprofitable servants. And because of and because as they're good, they're perceived from his spirit. And as they're wrought by us, they're defiled and mixed with so much weakness and imperfection that they cannot endure the severity of God's judgment. So they cannot atone for sin because they, uh, they fail as finite, not measure up to God's glory, and merit nothing. They're all owed. They can't satisfy for past sins. Anything good in them is the product of the Spirit. What comes from us is defiled and imperfect. But then I love this next paragraph, paragraph 6. Notwithstanding, the persons of believers being accepted through Christ. And what doctrine is that? Justification. Huh? Justification. Justification. I'm glad somebody's awake. Because the persons are accepted, their good works are also accepted in Him. Not as though they were in this life wholly unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight, but that He, looking upon them in His Son, is pleased to accept and reward that which is sincere, although accompanied with many weaknesses and imperfections. Isn't that glorious? That as God accepts us, he accepts our feeble offerings of obedience in Christ. We're justified and our works are justified. And God takes pleasure in them. If you've ever seen Chariots of Fire, that great line where he tells his sister, that when he runs, he says, God takes pleasure. He does. He takes pleasure in what we do for his glory. He takes pleasure in the things that we try to, to serve him. And then they address the matter of works and the unregenerate. Works done by the unregenerate man, although for the matter of them, they may be things which God commands. <clears throat> now pay attention. And of good use, both to themselves and others. So you got a neighbor who's really a good husband and father, cuts his grass, might even cut your grass for you. Um, he uh, really is an upright individual. He has a good work ethic. He is, uh, doesn't get drunk or any of this. He does for the matter of things which God commands and a good use to themselves and to their others, their neighbors. Yet, because they proceed not from a heart purified by faith, nor are done in a right manner. So first it must come from faith a regenerate faith, in a right manner. Now, what does that mean? According to the word, nor to a right end, the glory of God. They are therefore sinful and cannot please God or make a man meet to receive grace from God. Yet their neglect of them is more sinful and displeasing unto God. Augustine called them splendid sins. I think that's a Great summary. You could write over paragraph seven. Splendid sins. They can do much good, but it's not a good work because it's not of a heart of faith. It's not done measured by the word of God. It's not done for the glory of God. Sinful. Now notice, cannot make a man meet to receive grace. Again, this would be dealing with Romanism and Arminianism that uh, by exercise of the will, people can uh, do these uh, acts of merit that then would cause God to be inclined to them. No, won't do that. But the neglect is yet even more sinful and displeasing. So just as our neglect is more sinful, even if we're not rightly motivated, their neglect is more sinful. There will be degrees of punishment of hell, and 
Um, there's no good hell, but well, hell will be less miserable for the, the man that lived an outwardly upright life. Yes, sir. So uh, a lot of my co Roman Catholic friends are super arrogating themselves in their pro-life work, uh, but they do a very good job of it. Uh, however, uh, there are very few Protestants that do any pro-life work whatsoever uh, by comparison, sheer numbers. So we would be falling into that uh, neglect, I suppose. Well, I guess it depends. You see, there's, there you get back at the first paragraph. Is pro-life work a one way that a Christian may serve God, or is a Christian being negligent if he's not doing pro-life work? It's the same about missionary work, or being right. a deacon, or an elder. Or People have different callings, church. and uh, so um, I think that uh, there might be a person who doesn't go around and pick it, but they might have an unwed mother living in their home. Or uh, they might, whether they're on their resources, give more money to support a Christ or faith center or whatever. Or they might not be involved in that work at all outside of their prayers and be involved in other things. So I think we have to, again, be careful uh, in terms of, since pro-life work is not a biblical revelation of our neighbors. Just on the topic of um, Does it matter tonight? <laughs> no, actually, we've been around topic pretty well. But um, that, the passage where Paul talks about how we're supposed to run the race specifically to attain the prize at the end, mm -hmm. there's also passages where he talks about um, judgment, where your, your works are judged by fire, and, and I think it would be smart as well. Um, if the Spirit works in us, then why are we Well, a number of things going on. In the first place, there are rewards by grace. And God's very gracious to give such rewards. Martin Lloyd Jones has a good sermon on that in his book on the section on the Beatitudes and Sermon on the Mount. Uh, second, um, the particular passage in Corinthians deals with ministerial labor. And if ministers are cutting corners, holding back the truth or whatever, they might be saved, but they can have nothing to give to the Lord. It's all going to be burned up then judgment is going to take place for the vindication of Christ uh, and his glory and our own demonstration that, yes, uh, we're sinners and we're weak, but uh, uh, God is doing these things in his justified people. So my understanding is that um, someone who's sanctified can still do works but not inspired of like, the Spirit, and that's why this... this Say again? Um, someone who is sanctified Well, yes, we said that. You can do them with not completely in dependence upon the Spirit, is how I would want to do it. Uh, I think there are some places in the Scripture that uh, tell Christians that someday we will have to give account to, mm -hmm. to God. And um, But you know, on the other hand, we know that we, on the Day of Judgment, we are, um, we, we are justified by Christ. So, uh, would it be a moment that in, in the day of judgment that would be a shame of the Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to give an answer for the deeds done in the flesh. Uh -huh. And so, but uh, James calls it a uh, the judgment of liberty and the royal judgment, so that uh, the royal law, so that we're not going to be judged by the same severity that the non Christian is. Uh -huh. But yes, uh, we are going to be shown. Um, so that then the beauty and glory of Christ become all the more evident. And he steps forward and says, yes, but I've cut the beast. But we're going to give an answer. That's part of living in the fear of God. Every deed done in the body, thought, word. Okay? Very good, folks. Well, we're on schedule. So uh, next week, <coughs> lesson eight. And uh, this week, I'll, I mean, next week, I'll try to start uh, grading your uh, examination. So. I look forward to it. That's a lot.
lot of reading. How did you read such a lot? Thank you for watching this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu.